Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm back for my final episode with Anthony Walsh, former pro cyclist and the host of the Roadman Cycling Podcast. And today, we're going to talk about heart rate zone training. And it's really interesting that this has gotten so much press and zone two is really, quote, hot right now, you know. And there's a lot of benefits to zone two, trust me. Like it's something phenomenal for your HRV, for improving aerobic capacity. But today we're gonna talk about the benefits of training in all the different heart rate zones and how you can split up your time during the week so that you can get the benefits of the different heart rate zones. This is a great practical podcast for people out there that want to improve their fitness. And as a side note, after listening to this show, if you get excited about zone training, you should definitely check out AIM7 because we break all this stuff down in the app and make it really useful for you so you can put the information you're going to hear today into practice. So let's get right into it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. So with your background in cycling, cycling is predominantly an aerobic sport. I mean, there's moments of or periods of time where you're really going to have to push it. But we know the impact that uh, having a strong aerobic system has on longevity, increasing your VO2 max. I'd really love to get your thoughts on like for the average person, like how would you go about increasing just aerobic capacity to improve longevity? It is really interesting because this has become a mainstream debate and you hear doctors like Peter Atia talking about it. But endurance athletes have known this stuff for decades. And they've been working on optimizing this stuff for decades. So we have different zones, training zones. So zone two is the one that's got a bunch of popularity at the moment. And zone two, you'd expect to get adaptations like increased capillarization, like building more mitochondria, which are like the powerhouses of cells. But also we have other zones. We have zone one, we have zone three, we have zone four, we have zone five, zone six. So in each one of those zones, you have an associated physiological benefit. So when you look at your training hours over the course of the week, so say you can allocate six hours for cardiovascular over the course of the week, you need to be distributing your time. So you're spending some time in each one of those zones to get that associated physiological adaptation. So if you just spend all your time training in zone two or all your time training in zone three, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with spending your time there, but you're missing out on the adaptations from all those other zones. So it's just not an economical way to structure your training week, regardless of your goals. So if we're talking about the general population, right, and a general population to live longer, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So that's basically zone two and up, right? Zone one, you're going to get some benefit, but it's it's not going to be high enough mets. How would you recommend somebody go about this? Like if 300 minutes is what you're going to get a week and you want to live longer, what would you recommend? So what's kind of their typical division for the 300 minutes? Are they trying to that all in one go, or is that like broken up into... Broken up. The average the weekends? Average person that's like, hey, I got an elliptical or a bike or... Tread, you know what I'm saying? Like just busy parent. So I would probably aim to do... There's varying science on this. Some people will say as high as 80% of easy aerobic training. So aerobic training to be zone two or zone three. So that could be like a brisk walk, a hill walk, a weighted vest walk. Uh, if you can run or cycle or easy on the rowing machine, that would fall into that. I would say of somebody that's only doing five hours a week to do 80% is probably a touch overkill. I would say 50% of your time, so like two and a half hours a week, you want to go for long aerobic training. You definitely want to be thrown in some harder stuff then. So you're looking at you have two and a half hours left. So I would nearly split that into three sessions where you're doing one session where you're at threshold. So a threshold session could be, you know, if you have a stationary bike, getting on the bike and doing 60 minute session of two by 20 minutes, as hard as you can go for that 20 minutes. You don't 20 even need minutes? The, yeah. So you don't even need like, you know, we've advanced stuff now, like uh, blood lactate monitors, power meters, stuff like this, but rate of perceived exertion is shown to be so, so effective. So mm-hmm. if I say to you to go as hard as you can for 20 minutes and you're looking to pace it, so you're looking to start and finish at roughly the same intensity, you're going to land at about a seven and a half, eight out of 10 intensity okay. that you can maintain for 20 minutes. 
So seven and a half, eight out of 10 correlates roughly to threshold work. So a very good traditional threshold session would be two by 20 threshold. Mm. Now, if I moved on to something like VO2 max, VO2 max is anything from three to five minutes in duration. So if we split that and we said it was a four minute VO2 max interval, and we're looking for you to do three of those inside a 30 minute session. So for the rest of it, you're just doing easy zone one or zone two, riding, walking, running, rowing, whatever. But in those three minute intensity efforts, you're going to go full gas for the three minutes. Well, full gas for three minutes, if you try and pace it the same at the start and the end, that's going to roughly correlate to an eight and a half to nine and a half out of 10 perceived effort, which tags into VO2 max. So we don't need that advanced, you know, expensive data analytics platforms that elite athletes have access to, to determine what zone we're in, as long as we're starting our effort and ending our effort the same. And then the final session I would look to do, again, you could do it inside 30 minutes. It'd be adding five 10 second efforts into a session where there are 10 out of 10 maximum intensity for 10 seconds. So if you distribute your time across the week like that, you're getting that associated physiological adaptation from zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, zone six. And you're ticking a lot of boxes from longevity, from anti-aging, disease prevention, and building a huge aerobic and anaerobic base. I love this. One of my pillars every week is to do the four by four, which would be in the VO2 max kind of criteria. And I hate it. I mean, I absolutely hate it, <laughs> but I do it. And um, especially that last four minute interval, I try to get to the point where I just literally don't want to go anymore. And my heart rate typically gets all like 179, 180, and then I'm just like dead, right? Yeah. But, so you're um, doing them at like over 10 millimoles of lactase if you're going full gas for that. So that's a pretty miserable place to be. And if you don't have those lactate machines, one of my early coaches described those intervals best to me for I said, well, how hard should those VO2 sessions be? And he said, for each one of them, go till you see Jesus. <laughs> it's true, man. Like, you know, zone two, you get more of this eccentric cardiac hypertrophy. What does that mean? You, the, the left ventricle of your heart's going to be able to expand more. You're going to be able to push more blood per beat. So your cardiac output improves. But then this, these VO2 max sessions, like you actually develop what's called concentric hypertrophy. So the wall actually thickens a little bit. And you get more power. But you also get these other adaptations, you know, better utilization of oxygen, which is directly related to longevity. So 50% of your week, zone two, get one of these uh, threshold session in, a VO2 max session. What was the last one? You said five by 10 seconds? Sprint session. So five by 10 seconds. So you could do this running, rowing, swimming, bike, like anything. But the neuromuscular benefits you'll get from something like that, it's massive. And you know what the brilliant thing with these sessions? When you move away from zone two, which I know it's super trendy at the moment, there's great science behind it. But there's also great science behind training at all the other intensities. There's such great bang for your buck. Like the ROI on training time is massive. You can do a session like a, a Tabata session, really famous session in endurance sports where you're doing a gentle warm-up for five minutes and then you're going to complete a 20 second full gas effort as hard as you can go for 20 seconds 10 seconds recovery and you're going to repeat that for four minutes so you're 20 seconds full 10 seconds recovery 20 seconds full 10 seconds recovery for an entire four minutes then you go four minutes easy and then you repeat the working session again so it's two four minute efforts inside a 20 minute workout you will trash yourself on that. So like I have friends going, oh, I don't have time to work out. You haven't got 20 minutes. You know, who hasn't got 20 minutes in the day? You know, I coach CEOs who run 5,000 people companies and they have 20 minutes. Everyone has 20 minutes. A hundred percent. The key is not hurting yourself. So you need to get warmed up effectively. And you want to pick the right equipment to do it on. It's like a bike is safe. You do not want to do this like kettlebell swings you would be, have such delayed onset muscle soreness that you may end up in a hospital with rhabdo. But people do that <laughs> stuff. They don't think about this. They're like, oh, I'm going to go push a sled and they haven't been running and then they blow out their Achilles. So it's really important to pick the right equipment. Something else that I'd love to get your feedback on is when you're ramping up into these intervals, unless it's the five by 10 seconds, like slowly get your heart rate up there. Meaning like if you went from zone two and you're like, okay, now I got to get to zone five, like take a minute to get there and then hold your heart rate. Does that make sense? Yeah, but you know, your heart rate's always going to be a lagging indicator for you. Like if me and you were at one side of the room and then we sprint to the other side of the room and we're both sitting at 70 beats on the left side of the room, we sprint to the right. 
we're still going to be on like 70 beats probably when we get to the other side of the room and then it's going to go 80, 90, 100, 100. Right, so right. heart rate lags behind effort. So if you're doing something like your sprint or VO2 max, it's much more accurate to pace it off your rate of perceived exertion unless you have access to power meters and advanced tools like this. But if you pace it off rate of perceived effort, it's a much more accurate way to get there because if you try with heart rate, you normally start out way too hard because you're trying to get your heart rate up. So you're, if you take a threshold effort where you're trying to get at an 8 out of 10 effort, so for someone with a 185 max heart rate, your threshold is going to be about 88 to 91% of that. So you're going to be like 170 beats to 175 beats is your threshold effort. But if I'm riding that like 120 beats or I'm running at 120 beats to try and ramp to 170 beats, you end up way overshooting the actual effort. So you're putting down zone five, zone six effort because your heart rate's coming up slow. And heart rate's affected by so many things like sleep, caffeine, stress. So we might never get to that heart rate zone, but our body is still producing the power or the pace if we're swimming or running of that effort. So I definitely encourage people to use heart rate, but to also be cautious that it does have some inbuilt limitations. It's really good, man. I really like that. So RPE and then heart rate are, you can, you know, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, use the RPE and just know that there's limitations to, to the heart rate. I spoke to with, do you know who Alexander Boo is? Alexander Boo? That sounds familiar, but. So anyone in the kind of triathlon world will uh, know who Alexander Boo is. He is coaching the two best triathletes in the world at the moment, two Norwegian guys. And I spoke to him on the podcast and this guy is, you know, in any sport, you have coaches that make small incremental changes and the sport kind of, it moves a little bit and people get better year on year. But every now and then you get a person that comes into a sport and they totally redefine the trajectory of athletes in the sport. So Alexander Boo has come into triathlon and he's not a triathlete. He's not a triathlon coach. He's an engineer. So he's come into triathlon to solve speed as an engineering problem. And he's looking at it more through Mm -hmm. a Formula One lens. And I was talking to him a lot about rate of perceived exertion because it's something people dismiss because it's free. And we think, oh, well, a heart rate monitor or a power meter or even a lactate meter, you know, these are going to be much better because they're more expensive. But all of these things are a proxy for our feelings. And when you tune into rate of perceived exertion, you're actually asking yourself the question, well, how do I feel? How do I feel on a scale of one to 10 where one is the easiest and 10 is the hardest? And that's where he's trying to get his athletes to now, even with all the advanced technology they have. You wake up in the morning. How do you feel? Do you feel like training today? You feel like going Mm. long or do you feel like going short and fast? Or you feel like having a day off? And it's really, really powerful to just check in and see how you feel during and after sessions. That interoception is critical to develop. 100%. It's so, so important. And I know you know, you and everyone else are, they're pushing some serious tech and it has its place for sure, heart rate variability, but they're all windows to try and answer that question, how are you feeling? And you also shouldn't forget to listen to that voice of how are you feeling? Don't drown it out in data. Yeah. And that's why actually in AIM7, our algorithms account for how you feel because that is the missing link. And we ask people this in a very unique survey that covers everything from their motivation, their mood, their soreness, their stress, their energy, all these different things. And then the models are built around them so we can know if something's a significant change or not. Uh, But you're exactly right. Just objective static data, it's not a complete picture. You need a whole lot more than that. So I love that you're acknowledging that. And I think that to athletes or anybody in general, it discredits how they feel and then they lose trust in the system. So that's what I've seen. Yes, I do, but I don't wear a Whoop because I like it. I wear a Whoop because I just want to look at their UI. It's interesting if you wear, I've experimented with Whoop and Aura Ring for the past year. I don't want to say there's no correlation with how I feel, but I've had some of my best rides and put down some of my best power numbers on the bike on days when I've woke up and it said my recovery score is 20% and I should go easy today. Yeah, you should ignore those things. They're so bad. I need to get you on AIM7, man. You still wear your Aura Ring? I'm not wearing my ring now. I'm on a whoop at the moment. Uh, just wanted to kind of play around with the difference between Aura Ring and Aura Ring also moved to a weird model as well, where I bought it at a time where it was a one and done fee. And then they got you with the, oh yeah, you've done it with a one and one fee, but it was like a little bait and switch. And it's like, oh, now there's a monthly membership as well. So I was like, ah, you know, uh, I didn't sign up for that. Oh, geez. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm free for life on all that. But the 
like whoop for a long time, measured their heart rate variability. They said they took it to the last slow wave sleep a period during sleep, which is impossible to measure. <laughs> like we know that those sleep stages are bogus. And it was so awful that they had to then quietly backtrack, never say publicly that they changed anything. And now if you look at their HRV measure with Aura, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, they're just taking mm-hmm. HRV across the sleep period. That's very interesting. I know I'm very skeptical of it now. And some of it's like, I don't know, it's just data for data sake with a whoop sometimes. And I think the next wave is like you're doing with AIM7. It's interpreting this data. Like, what do we do with the mind field? Because like I'm snowed under with data. Like I've continuous glucose monitors, you know, sweat monitors. <laughs> I bet you do. And it's like, you know, brands are sending them out for me to check them out. And I think it's all brilliant, like the continuous glucose monitor. I'm not sure if you've played around with that. I've been using Super Sapiens and it's really interesting, but I'm like, I don't really know what to do with this data. Like, you know, it's it leaves too much up to the user. Like you need to turn into your own personal laboratory because I can go to bed, wake up and have like a serving of porridge, which is weighed out on a digital scales and it has X effect on my blood sugar go to bed, have the exact same amount of sleep, have the exact same food, and it'll have a totally different effect on my blood sugar. And you're left to determine the meaning of that yourself, which I'm sure if you had enough time and resources, you could dig in and interpret this yourself. But, you know, what's the point of that? No, it's too complicated for the average person to get any use out of. And so you need a system. And that's what we're building is you have to have a very rich data set. And then you got to be able to tie it back to the individual. So you have to have an individual level model. And then the secret sauce is how do you tie it into a behavior design model that's tied to the things you actually will do or will enjoy doing. Otherwise, like if it says you need to go eat canned sardines, you're going to be like, I don't like canned sardines. I'm turning this (laughs) off. Uh, So there's the behavior component to this. That's the panacea. And we work very hard to understand our members' behavior and what they like to do. So it's we're never recommending something that's outside of the scope of their comfort zone. So I'm excited over time with people like you who are just elite at what they do. We need to connect offline uh, because I think that there's some ways we can get some feedback from y'all because if we can if we can please that community, it kind of I think it's kind of a bleed out effect because they're the hardest to to win. And then it's kind of like anything else. You develop a technology like GPS was developed for soldiers. And then what do you do? You start expanding its capabilities. And now everybody's got GPS in their phone and they can't go anywhere without it anymore. (laughs) Nobody has a map, you know, what happened to (laughs) MapQuest or even before that, like the Rand McNally map, right? So, but hey, buddy, I really appreciate you coming on the show. This has been so much fun. You're a pro, man. I just love the depth. I remember being, when I was on your show, I don't know if it's just about the scenery or whatever it is, but you, you have such a depth to you that I really appreciate And I'm excited to continue this relationship. And I'd love to have you back on sometime again. Definitely, Eric. Thank you for the opportunity. I love talking sports, love talking to a fellow podcaster. And, you know, everything you said uh, is echoed back to you. You know, I love what you guys are doing. I love what AIM7 is doing. So keep on building. Thanks, brother. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please do us a favor. Leave us a rating in whichever listening platform you are joining us from, as this is the best way that you can help the show grow. Thanks again for listening. I'll catch you on the next episode.